Well, it is it's brilliant. Let me give you a warm welcome to this evening, whether you're um, with us live now or if you're watching the recording. Um, my name's Bev Doubly. I'm on the staff at Surrey Chapel, which is a Christian church in the centre of Norwich. And I'm going to be your host for this evening. Um, in a few moments, I'm going to introduce you um, to our speaker tonight, who is Dr. Peter Saunders. He's going to be speaking to us. We're going to be um, having um, a discussion about the impact of COVID-19 and, and whether the hope that the vaccine has brought is enough, is enough to give us lasting hope. Um, let me just do a little bit of housekeeping first before we get on to the meat of our session. Um, first of all, as you will have discovered, all power is in the hands of Kieran, who's our admin for tonight. Um, so you're all muted. Um, it just makes it easier and less hectic when um, there's lots of people on. So we would love you to ask questions. Um, you can do that by using the chat function on your screens or by texting me directly. Um, my number will probably come up in the chat um, shortly, but it's 07 456 388. So text or send something in the chat, but do be typing in stuff at any point in the evening and I'll be keeping track of those questions. Second thing just to say quickly is that the session is being um, recorded, um, but only the um, screens of those speaking will come up. So don't worry, you won't be going out. Um, on a recording later. Okay, well um, you may well have seen in the news last Friday we marked the one year anniversary of when the UK reported its first um, Covid death. Um, looking at the figures at midday today and um, there were 124,501 deaths in the UK, that's probably changed now, um, and globally just over two and a half million lives lost to this virus. And those stats have just become a part of everyday life, haven't they? They're on the TV every day. Um, I guess that's the, the shocking thing about it. Um, and who, who could have conceived <laughs> this time last year that we would be coming out of another lockdown one year on, that our children would have had another lengthy spell um, of homeschooling only returning um, this week? Um, the upside is that, that Britain um, is leading the way in Europe, or globally really, um, next to Israel with the vaccine rollout. And fresh from his vaccine today is our speaker, um, Dr Peter Saunders. And I'm just so relieved um, that having had the Oxford vaccine, that he's, he's well <laughs> and able to be with us um, tonight. So, um, Peter, do you want to unmute yourself and... Um, I would love to, to introduce you. Peter, tell us, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from and about your family, first of all? Thanks, Bill. Well, it's, it's a real privilege and pleasure to be with you tonight to, to look at this subject. So my name's Peter Saunders. I come originally from New Zealand, where I, I grew up and uh, trained in medicine and then specialised in general surgery. I married my best friend's sister and uh, we uh, she she was also a doctor specializing in pediatrics and and way back in the late 80s we left New Zealand and went to work in Africa with the Africa Inland Mission in a mission hospital in Kenya. Uh, we had two small children at that stage we we went from there to the UK where we spent a couple of years at All Nations Christian College with 140 students from from uh, 40 countries around the world who are all going to work in cross-cultural mission situations abroad. And uh, we had our third child there. And I'm, I then uh, moved out of clinical medicine. Uh, God called me out of that into student ministry with the Christian Medical Fellowship in the UK, which brings together 5,000 doctors and 1,000 students throughout the UK and Ireland. And then I went from there to being the CEO of CMF, so 27 years. During that time, I met Bev Dubley, who was working with the UCCF uh, some years uh, ago. And then uh, after 27 years with, with uh, Christian Medical Fellowship, two years ago, <coughs> I moved to the ICMDA, which is the International Christian Medical and Dental Association. So the ICMDA brings together 80 national uh, groups of Christian doctors and dentists around the world. So it's quite a, a rapidly growing movement. 
and uh, probably 60,000 doctors and dentists altogether, we, we reckon, in uh, those 80 plus countries and uh, all seeking to, to serve uh, in medicine or, or dentistry. So that's my, my background. I'm a passionate rugby supporter. I believe your pastor, Andy Reese, I believe is a Welshman. Well, so I won't be mentioning the names of Andy Hayden uh, tonight or Robbie Deans, but um, I, I think we share that passion. <laughs> You're right. You're fantastic, thank you. Um, look, tell us a little bit more about your role now. I'm guessing you've been kept especially busy over the last 12 months, um, perhaps with people like us asking for your global perspective on things, but obviously all the, the guys that you're supporting across the world as well. Um, uh, in what ways has your job been different this year because of the pandemic? Well, we, we have our aim as a, a Christian or a vision, if you like, as a Christian witness through doctors and dentists in every community and in every nation. That's our dream. And so, but we really exist to start and to strengthen national movements of Christian doctors and dentists. And a lot of the focus is on leadership training and development. So I've got a, a team of we have just four uh, paid staff. We have uh, over 50 field workers, all of whom are doctors and dentists in different parts of the world who spend a lot of time, their spare time working with ICMDA. And um, we divide the world up into to 14 regions. So there's a lot to be done at lots of conferences, events, and that kind of thing. In my first year with ICMDA, I, I, uh, went on 20 overseas trips and visited 19 different countries. But in my second year, which began around this time last year with a, a trip to Kazakhstan being canceled because of COVID, that was, uh, so, so the last 12 months, I've been sitting here in my dining room and we have really completely changed the way we work. So there is as much activity, we are just as busy, but we do it through uh, webinars, virtual conferences, online meetings, that kind of stuff. But we can see now the, the, uh, the end, hopefully, and back to an existence which will be probably halfway between what we're doing now and what we did the previous year. Mm, thank you. I was gonna ask, um, have, have you felt at all over the last 12 months that you'd have liked to have been back in clinical medicine? Well, I've been, I, I'm a fully qualified general surgeon, but I only practiced for about 10 years after I graduated uh, from medical school. So I've actually been out of clinical medicine now for, uh, since 1992 was the last time I did a surgical operation and surgery's changed quite a bit since then. Yeah, I, I loved being a surgeon. I really did. Um, but I believe that God called me out of that into this work. Uh, encouraging and uh, serving Christian doctors and, and dentists, really. So I'm very content where I am, uh, but I'm, I still have lots of exposure to doctors and dentists who are on the front line and not uh, in, in a whole host of different contexts, as you can imagine, because we're a worldwide movement. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Just, just one final question before we let you uh, take to the floor. Um, have you, you've spoken about God leading you in, in, in your work. Um, have you ever had any difficulty um, integrating your Christian faith with being a doctor? I think there are challenges with being a Christian doctor, but I, I feel it's really a very close fit. We talk about Jesus Christ as being the great physician and uh, because of his passion for uh, healing men's and women's souls and their bodies. He, so we read that he sent his disciples out initially to, to preach the gospel and to, to heal the sick. So the two have always come together. And two of the longest books in the, in the New Testament, the book of Luke and the book of Acts, were both written by a, Greek, a, a, a Jewish doctor in Greek, uh, Luke, a physician. And so right from the beginning, there's been a very close connection between uh, Christianity and and medicine and nursing and uh, a lot of the history of medicine, a lot of the pioneers in medicine were Christian believers throughout the, the centuries. We could talk a lot about that, but I think the fundamental Christian commitment 
uh, and conviction, uh, which provides a foundation for medicine and for my life really, is that I believe every human being is incredibly precious for two reasons. Firstly, because they're made in the image of God and therefore of great value and uh, worth uh, caring for. Uh, and secondly, because we believe as Christians that God himself became a human being and as a result gave a nobility to humanity. And that, that there, for those two reasons, that they're a great motivator. And, and I think also that the, the Christian uh, worldview, uh, the example of, of Christ in, uh, in ministering to people's bodies and their souls together is a, is a great model to follow. So no, I haven't, I haven't seen a conflict. It's been my major motivation. And I think there are, well, there are at least 60,000 doctors and dentists in ICMDA from all around the world, from every culture and language group who would tell you pretty much the same. Okay, thank you very much. Perhaps um, somebody might have some more questions to follow up on that after your talk, but let me hand over to you now and um, to explain some more. Great, so there, there we are. So I've been asked to speak on this topic, are vaccines enough? Hope in the face of COVID, and to talk not just about medical hope, but also to talk a bit about Christian hope as well, uh, following on from that. So let's look at the medical aspects first. And this is the extraordinary nanobot, uh, micro robot virus that's absolutely changed our lives in the last uh, year or so. And we all know the history of it. And if we look at a map of the world today, this is from the Johns Hopkins Institute, which shows where most of the cases are, and you see most heavily hit have been North and South America, Europe, South Asia, and there have been other parts of the world where relatively it's been spared, but may still be at an early stage. If we look at the cases worldwide, you can see on the left, the daily new cases have gone up from uh, way back in February, March last year to a peak uh, in, in January this year, and then are beginning to fall again. And the daily deaths have, have followed that pattern. We know that the, the numbers of early cases were grossly underestimated because we weren't testing, and the deaths have always been a much more reliable indicator of where we're at. But we've just come through the very worst period of it in the last month or two when we look at the figures worldwide. So these are the numbers that, uh, that Bev mentioned earlier, uh, almost 120 million cases, probably a lot more because we weren't testing early and 2.6 million deaths altogether. And on the right there, you've got the graphs from the UK and US of, uh, of new cases per day. And you can see how dramatically those have fallen over the last month or two. And that's generally very good news. We know that for most people, this virus just causes a mild uh, condition, but that for about 5% or so, it's very serious involving hospital, not just hospitalization, but intensive care as well. And on the right, you see the age graph. And we, we know that those over 60, and I'm just in that age group, are most at risk. So these are the percentage of the deceased in Italy and the UK and you can see that the highest peak is in the 80 to 89 age group. So if you're under 50, you're pretty safe. If you're over six, between 60 and 70, you've got a 3% chance of dying. 70 to 79, um, a, an 8% chance. 80 to 90, a 15% chance of dying uh, altogether with it. And those with other existing conditions like uh, heart disease, diabetes, uh, and so on, are much more vulnerable. And the graph on the right there, you'll see that the little blue square, it's only 1% of those who die who have no related condition. So this is, a, this is a disease, thankfully, which affects largely only the elderly population and those with associated multiple conditions, although of course there are exceptions, but we can be incredibly thankful that children have been spared in this. How serious is it? Well, on the graph on the, on the right, you have, first of all, on the vertical axis, you've got uh, 
how virulent it is. In other words, how likely you are to die from it, uh, uh, the disease we're considering. And then on the, on the horizontal axis along the bottom, you've got its infectious uh, nature, how likely you are to catch it. And you see in, in this graph, right up the top here, let's just uh, go back a bit. I put a circle here around bird flu and Ebola. Uh, if you get those, you're more, more than likely to die from them. Uh, and on the bottom here, measles and chickenpox are, are two of the diseases that it's most easy to catch. Now, when we look at COVID, it's somewhere in this box here. So it's only moderately infectious and moderately virulent with a, with a fatality rate that's probably around 1%. So again, we can be incredibly thankful with this that we're not dealing with something, imagine something that, that was as virulent as Ebola or bird flu and was as easy to catch as measles and chickenpox, which would put it up in this corner here. And you can see that uh, so bad as COVID has been, it's, uh, it could have been so much worse than it is. Uh, but it, it is bad because if we look at uh, infectious diseases that are killing people way back in September last year, when the number of deaths were still quite low, was when coronavirus became the biggest killer of all infections in the world. And it's still at that level. <clears throat> if we look back in human history at all the, the plagues or pandemics that there have been, there's only been seven that have been worse than uh, than coronavirus in terms of the number killed. The worst of all was the, the Black Death, and then to the last century, the Spanish flu and the HIV AIDS epidemic have killed many more people. But uh, nonetheless, coronavirus is number eight on that list. Only seven have been worse in the whole of human history in terms of the number of deaths. So it's very serious. And the UK has been hit incredibly hard these are the worst 20 countries by total deaths. And you can see the UK there is at number five uh, with 124,000 deaths just yesterday. So of the 194 countries in the world, we're number five in terms of total deaths. A much more accurate measure of its severity is the number of deaths per million population. So this is adjusted for the population size. And you can see again that the UK is at number six on both measures. And the only countries above us are tiny countries in, in Europe with much smaller populations than us. So we are the worst country in the world uh, with a reasonable population in terms of the number of deaths per million population. Uh, why is it so bad? Well, uh, let's look at a comparison between other island nations and the UK, because it's quite remarkable. Now, I said I came from New Zealand, which has 5 million population. There have only been 26 deaths in New Zealand in total, 26, not 26,000, but 26, that's all. Uh, and deaths per million, five, that's the figure. Taiwan, even better, 23 million population, only 10 deaths in Taiwan. In Singapore, only 29 deaths. Uh, Hong Kong and Japan are getting slightly higher numbers, but look, in terms of deaths per million, how they compare with the UK with 124,000 deaths and 1,827 deaths per million population. So it's 30 times worse than Japan, but it's more than 300 times worse than New Zealand and 3,000 times worse than Taiwan. And so that raises the question, now why is it that here my uncle and my mother are celebrating his 90th birthday with the extended family six weeks ago in New Zealand with no social distancing whatsoever, and we're still effectively in lockdown, only just starting to emerge. And the reason uh, that the UK has performed so poorly is not difficult to work out. Uh, we made huge mistakes at the beginning of this pandemic. And uh, here they are, we failed to close our borders. We did it around for many weeks, uh, unlike other island nations. I have a friend who's a doctor in Taiwan he said they intercepted early on, Chinese doctors discussing this on the internet, knew something was bad, closed their borders immediately, and that's why they managed to escape. But we let the virus in in huge numbers. We let it escape into care homes to kill lots of vulnerable people. We locked down very late compared to other countries. We then thought it was all over and lifted restrictions too early in the summer, 
and we never managed to get a track and trace system work. And as a result, we have one of the first worst fatality rates in the whole world. And uh, on the flip side of that, why did other island nations, the ones I've listed, do so well? Well, they did exactly the opposite. They closed their borders early. They didn't let the virus into care homes. They implemented uh, uh, mitigating measures like hand hygiene, social distancing. They locked down early. They implemented effective track and trace systems. One of my, uh, or my sister-in-law, is a, a GP in Auckland and she leads a track and trace team. And right through the whole pandemic, they've known where every single case was and every single contact, and they've tracked everyone down uh, into the ground, which is why New Zealand has done so well, similar techniques in these other countries that have. So what defenses have we got, got against this disease? Well, there's basically three. We can slow down its spread. We can, we can treat serious cases, we now have some treatments, or we can prevent it by vaccination. Let's just think about those. So we, we're all very familiar now with the, the mitigating measures to slow down spread, hand hygiene, social distancing, masks, uh, and so on, test, track and trace, lockdown. And the, the fact is that these measures are actually incredibly effective, incredibly effective in slowing spread, which is why uh, when they're implemented, the numbers very quickly peak and then drop. And uh, this has led people to think it's all over just because uh, the numbers drop so, so quickly. When we come to treatments, uh, we had no treatments at first, nothing to, to give to people who were affected badly with us in intensive care. But now we know that there are things that really do work. The wonder drug has been dexamethasone, a steroid, uh, remdesivir, some effectiveness, but also nursing people in the intensive uh, care departments prone. In other words, face down on ventilators makes a huge difference and oxygen and proper ventilatory support has made uh, a huge inroads. And so we see now at the end of last year that fatality rates were down 30% since April at the beginning and that's because we're so much better at treating it so if you if you get COVID badly and you end up in intensive care uh, you you're still in great danger but you've got a much better chance of surviving now than you had at the beginning of this so mitigation member uh, methods medical treatments but it's actually vaccines that are the absolute game changer in this battle against uh, coronavirus and uh, what's very interesting about this is that whereas Britain was really probably arguably the world's worst at the beginning in terms of containing this and dealing with it, when it comes to vaccines, we're absolutely at the other end of the spectrum and we are one of the world's best. In fact, we rank number three in terms of vaccine rollout. Uh, so that's incredibly good news to, to grasp and to be thankful for. These are the, <coughs> the COVID cases in the UK. You'll see the early peak in March, April, May last year. That should have been a lot higher than it was. And it, it, there were uh, many uh, much greater numbers, but we weren't measuring it then. So those numbers are very inaccurate. And then we've had these, the second peak, and then of course the third peak over Christmas, New Year that we've all heard about. And then the dramatic drop of cases after that. When we look at deaths, and this is a much better measure of how many cases have been, we see that, that there was a big peak of deaths at the beginning, but a much bigger uh, peak over Christmas New Year, up to a peak of, of uh, 1,800 uh, deaths a day on the 20th of January, which was the worst day of all. But then a rapid fall after that down to just a few hundred now, and there were less than 100 deaths yesterday. So uh, it's good news. And why is this? Well, uh, of course, mitigating me measures always play a role, but the real game changer is the UK vaccines. And there have been five different vaccines that have been uh, approved in the UK. And uh, here they are. These are becoming household names now, AstraZeneca, Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, and uh, and then we have Novavax and Janssen, and it's just the first two at the moment that uh, in, are in action, but the others are going to come on stream. 
And the UK is amply oversupplied with vaccines because one thing our government really did right was to order millions of doses of these before they were actually available. And so this is why the UK is so far ahead of the rest of, rest of Europe, is that we had these vaccines ordered and available. And we didn't know at that stage which ones were going to be successful and which weren't, but we covered our bases incredibly well. And then the plan to vaccinate people was very carefully and wisely thought through. So we're through the yellow zone now from January to the 15th of February with uh, everyone uh, down to the age of 70 being vaccinated. And we're now halfway through the blue zone. So uh, the, the biggest hump was the 16 to 64 year olds with underlying health conditions, 7 million of them, but we're now through that lot where we're into the 60 to 64 year olds and, and people under 60 are now getting letters. So the rollout has been incredible, uh, phenomenal and uh, extraordinarily well organized and a real credit to the NHS in particular uh, general practitioners in terms of getting that going, but it was a combined private and public effort. So when we look at the overall figures, 124,000 deaths, over 4 million cases, but uh, you can see now over 22,000 have been vaccinated in a population of 68, sorry, 22 million have been vaccinated in a population of 68 million, so almost a third of the population. And the numbers in hospital are falling, so there was a peak at 30,000, it's still pretty high at 10,000, but is coming down uh, every, every day. <clears throat> uh, so more than 23 million vaccine doses received across the UK to the 6th of March, uh, and now uh, over 300,000 have had their second doses as well of either Pfizer or Moderna. Now, if we make this comparison with other countries in the world, we see that the, the overall winner way ahead of everybody is Israel. So Israel have administered 100 vaccine doses per 100 people. So on average, everyone has had a dose and they continue to roll it out. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. Number two is <coughs> this uh, second line here is the United Arab Emirates and the United Kingdom is in third place. So we're now up to about 34% of uh, or 34 vaccine doses per per 100 people. So we're, we're way ahead of uh, any of these countries down the bottom. This is where all the European countries are, most of them less than 10 doses administered per 100 people. But the other country, the other big country that's doing phenomenally well in this is the US, which is this pink line, which is running parallel to the UK line. So you get the message, it's a very serious disease. We uh, made a lot of errors at the beginning, but in terms of our vaccine rollout, we've been uh, third in the world, incredible progress. And, and we see in Israel now, these figures are a month old now, I couldn't find more recent ones, but you can see uh, the, the fall in the over 60s being admitted to hospital in Israel uh, from the middle of January, whereas the under 60s are still rising. And that's clear evidence of uh, the effect of the vaccine because the over 60s have been vaccinated. Now with 100 doses per 100 people, the situation is even much, much better. And it makes perfect sense that given that the elderly and those with multiple conditions are most likely to die with this, if you can vaccinate all those people quickly, then you're very quickly removing between 90 and 95 percent of those who, who, who could have died if they'd got it from the vulnerable population. Uh, so all credit to the way it's been done. So some of the headlines, Israel eases restrictions following vaccine success. And then we've all heard about the UK roadmap in four stages. And today is the first stage of that, the 8th of March, where all schools are open and care home visits of one person can take place. <coughs> Shops open on the 12th of April, pubs serve indoors from the 17th of May, and you can go on international travel. And then by the 21st of June, the hope is that all legal limits on events and personal contact will be gone completely. <coughs> Now, uh, that all depends, of course, on four tests being 
uh, being matched. And those are uh, these, first of all, the vaccination program goes to plan. Well, uh, we have to say every indication are that it's going ahead of plan at the moment. So that's a big tick for that one. Vaccines are reducing deaths and hospital emissions. We're already seeing a big effect from that. That's another big tick. Infection rates don't cause a surge in hospital emissions. Well, kids are going back to school today. Uh, we'll have to wait and see, but I'd say it would be extremely unlikely that we would see a surge in hospital emissions because the vulnerable people have largely been vaccinated now. And then this last one, new variants don't fundamentally change the risk. And that's probably the biggest question mark. What uh, do the new variants mean? And what we've seen over the last uh, three or four months or so is that three new variants have come out, one from South Africa, one from Brazil, and one from the UK. And these new variants are easier to catch. They're more easily transmissible than the original COVID, and they're rapidly replacing other forms of COVID in these populations. But large, and we know they've spread to many countries, but the biggest hit has been taken by these three countries. The good thing that seems to be about these new variants is that they're not more virulent. In other words, they're easier to catch. So a bit more like measles and chickenpox, if you like, but they're not more virulent. They're not more likely to kill you, but it does mean that they will spread more quickly. And that's why we got the great big surge over Christmas and New Year. It was because of this new variant in the UK that, that the mitigating measures we put in place just weren't enough to contain it, whereas they worked before, which is why we had to go from tier three and four back into lockdown at that time. So uh, a bit of data that with the virus, they said initially it wasn't changing. We now know it is. We know the longer it spreads, the more variants there will, will be. And in places where it's, uh, what we also know that the, um, that the vaccines uh, as a general rule are not as effective against the three new variants, although they are still uh, uh, pretty effective against them. But we won't, won't have time to go into the details of that, but that's the take home message. So the new variants spread faster. They're not more likely to kill you if you catch them and the vaccines aren't quite as good uh, against them. And so that raises a question going into the future. But in the places where these have hit really hard, uh, particularly in Brazil and South Africa, there's been mayhem, and especially in, uh, in Brazil, in the town of Manaus, in, um, and in, in, the, uh, in the province of Am Amazonas, where Manaus is, the, the city of Manaus is, is uh, based and and I know doctors there personally and the descriptions of patients coming in and just not having enough oxygen to give them and people dying because adequate treatments weren't there. Thankfully, it's only been in a few places that this has happened. We now know that the South African variant is dominant in Zimbabwe. In other words, most people catching it in that country now are getting that later variant. And the big question, I guess, is um, what's going to happen in the future? And as I say, at the moment, there's no indication really that these new variants are any more virulent, more likely to kill you, but they are more easy to, to catch. But we are, we are reasonably confident that the, vac the vaccines, although they're not as effective against them, can be modified much more easily uh, than when they were first produced. And so overall, I, I describe it like this, we're between Scylla and Charybdis. And if you know your Greek mythology, you'll know the story of Odysseus who had to sail his boat between uh, Scylla and Charybdis, two monsters, the six headed monster of Scylla who picked his men off the deck and the whirlpool of Charybdis. Uh, we say today, you know, you're between the devil and the deep blue sea or between a rock and a hard place or out of the frying pan into the fire. And uh, you can't win either way, because on the one hand, we have the skiller of coronavirus, which is, as I said, the, first, the eighth worst plague in human history. But on the other, we have the effects of lockdown uh, on our populations, and especially in the developing world, hunger, famine, delay in treating other disease and economic collapse. And so you know, how do you balance these two difficult things and how do you get it right? And it's very difficult for any government to 
to get it right. The Lancet is one of the leading medical journals in the UK, and this is what they said, the, the pandemic is dismantling the foundations for protecting and advancing health. Global health has entered a new period of rapid reversal and de-development as the new norm. This is particularly the case in the developing world. So lockdown disrupting systems uh, leading to hunger and famine, people being pushed into poverty, worsening mental health, family breakdown, domestic abuse, stigma, and, and then of course, medicine's been inaccessible. And the problem was in a lot of developing countries, they instituted a kind of reflex lockdown right at the beginning before the, uh, the disease had come in and it did a lot more damage uh, than the disease did. And so this is a, a, a graph showing the four waves uh, of COVID uh, mortality and morbidity, that's uh, you know death and sickness from it. And the first wave is, is COVID itself, that's the pink graph. So we get a big peak of people uh, suffering and dying from COVID. But then after that, the second wave is the impact of resource restriction on urgent non-COVID conditions. So people who urgently need medical treatment, but they can't get into hospital because hospitals are fed up, uh, are filled up with COVID patients. And then the third wave is the impact of interrupted care on chronic conditions like high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes. And then the fourth wave is this red line of psychological trauma or mental illness. Some of the figures there from the, from the uh, CDC in the US that um, anxiety and depressive order disorders gone up in young people and 25% of young people have seriously considered suicide. So this was from last year. So Skiller and Charybdis, between the devil and the deep blue sea, between coronavirus and the effects of lockdown. And in, in some countries around the world, there've been uh, quite serious human rights abuses as well. And people are anxious about when COVID goes, will the human rights abuses stay? Of course, we know too about the economic effects, the growing government debt. We're now uh, where we have debt at the highest level in peacetime since the Second World War, and the numbers are really quite uh, bewildering. And yet some people have done incredibly well. The big tech companies, the FANG companies, Facebook, Amazon, uh, the uh, Alphabet, which is Google, uh, Net, uh, Netflix uh, and so on, have done incredibly well. Alibaba, Tencent, incredibly well. And uh, Elon Musk has become the uh, richest man in the world, although he's recently lost that title again. Electric cars, of course, Elon Musk and the company Tesla. So what we've seen is a widening gap between rich and poor around the world. Some people have got a lot richer, property owners, share owners, owners of investments, rich people and poor people, especially in the developing world have got poorer. So if you want to know more about, um, about ICMDA and the resources we have, there's lots of stuff on COVID, uh, COVID newsletter once a month, a whole series of webinars, a resource page, and uh, we record all our webinars and put them up. So this is Professor Annalise Wilder-Smith, who is an advisor to the WHO and a Bible-believing Christian talking about how we can deploy COVID vaccines equitably around the world. So if you've got time or are interested in that, go. So the question we looked at was this one, are vaccines enough? And uh, the answer is uh, yes, quite possibly, if we can distribute them quickly enough, that the more virulent new variants don't emerge, that immunity lasts, we think it lasts for at least six months, and that we'll, we can uh, also revaccinate people, and that the vaccines can be tweaked rather like the flu vaccine to act against new variants. And we've got a reasonable degree of confidence about those things, although only time will tell. But uh, are they enough for the collateral effects on the health and economy? Well, well those are huge. What about new, more easily transmissible and new virulent viruses uh, later uh, that aren't COVID, something worse? Uh, and they won't protect us against other diseases, which, are, which together, and we've got to put this in, into perspective, nearly uh, 2.6 million deaths from COVID, but there are 57 million people who die every year, and most of them just die from diseases other than COVID. That's always been the case. So these are the 10 biggest killers in the world. You can see ischemic heart disease, so that's heart attacks, kills 
over 9 million strokes, 6 million uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, that's lung disease, often related to smoking, 3 million. So uh, COVID is still relatively very small in terms of the number of people it kills, even at the height of the pandemic. And uh, vaccine's not going to uh, protect you from that. Benjamin Franklin in this world, nothing can be certain except death and taxes. Well, Rishi Sunak's uh, hasn't raised income tax yet, but we know there's a huge debt and it may be coming, but it's death, of course, that is certain. Uh, for all of us, uh, something's, we're all going to die from something and probably a disease or if not that, an accident of some kind. And it raises this question of, of hope and purpose. Uh, Viktor Frankl, who was the author of Man's Search for Meaning, was a Jewish psychiatrist who was locked up in Auschwitz concentration camp during the Second World War and treated people with depression. And uh, he, he wrote this amazing book, but uh, those who have a why to live, he said, can bear with almost any how. Uh, purpose and meaning is what gets you through difficult situations. The Shawshank Redemption, Britain's most popular film ever, the famous line from Andy Duchesne, who dug himself out of this prison in about 30 years, that hope is a good thing, maybe the best of good things and no good thing ever dies. So even though he was in a prison, he never lost hope because he could see something beyond it. And it raises these questions for us. Where does my hope come from? How do I make sense of suffering? And how do I make sense of death? In my uh, previous job with Christian Medical Fellowship, I did a lot of advocacy on end of life issues. We were trying to prevent the legalization of euthanasia. And so I, I met a lot of people and uh, two of those people who are involved in that debate were Daniel James and Matt Hampson, both rugby players, both broke their necks, both ended up paralyzed from the neck down. And yet Daniel went to kill himself at the, uh, at the clinic, the Dignitas Clinic in Switzerland, whereas Matt Hampson became uh, a motivational speaker, raising money to buy laptop computers for people who he described as less fortunate than himself. Now, it, it's a very interesting uh, comparison, but it, it tells you that it's much more than about the illness. It's much more about the person and the way they look at the future. Daniel couldn't see any hope for living with his injury. Matt uh, grasped and stared at the things he could still do and is still uh, an inspiration to, to many people. So uh, hope, death and suffering, but uh, these are big questions too. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? Questions about anthropology, origins, purpose and destiny. And they're questions that everybody has to, to ask. We all have what is called a worldview, a set of assumptions about life, the universe and everything, which shapes our beliefs, our values and our behavior. Like an iceberg, it's often only our behavior that people observe above the surface of the water, but it is determined by our fundamental uh, worldview convictions and beliefs. And there are four major different worldviews in the world. We haven't got time to go through all of these in great detail, but there is uh, theism, belief in a personal supreme God, uh, uh, polytheism, belief in multiple gods, pantheism, that's the worldview behind Hinduism and Buddhism, uh, belief in an impersonal life force, and atheism that life uh, uh, that God doesn't exist. And what's most interesting about these is, is the different view that these four worldviews have about what happens at death. And when we're talking about hope, uh, we can talk about hope from COVID with vaccines. We can talk about hope with other diseases, with other treatments that are available. We can talk about hope in terms of having a different perspective on life and what we've still got left. But uh, the question of death is incredibly important as well. Is there hope beyond death? And uh, so there are these four different worldviews. Intelligent people hold them all, and yet they can't all be true because they believe mutually contradictory things uh, about all of life, but, uh, but particularly we're looking at uh, death. For atheism, death is the end. So Bertrand Russell, the famous atheist philosopher, 
when I die, I rot and nothing of my ego will survive. That's the atheist view of death. And then the polytheistic view of death. Uh, this is um, this is uh, Gladiator, the film. If you've seen it, you'll know this is the final scene where he goes back to where his wife and son were murdered in the hope of seeing them again. We see them running down the path. So polytheism was the the uh, the uh, worldview of of the ancient Greeks, the Romans, the Babylonians, the Assyrians. Many of the great civilizations of the world believed in many gods and an afterlife where you existed as, as a spirit in this spirit world. And then uh, Hindus and Buddhists believe about uh, believe in reincarnation, that when you die, you go, uh, you're go, you reborn into the world and that you're in the cycle of life, death and rebirth, which goes around and around from which you can escape. And then when we come finally to theism, Islam, Judaism and Christianity, and uh, again, a completely different view that death is not the end. It's not uh, a gateway to being dismembered souls and spirits in the spirit world. It's not the gateway to reincarnation, but it leads to judgment where we meet God and we're sent to one of two destinations. And if you count out the people in the world, it, uh, almost half of them are in one of these categories. So if we look at Islam, Whoever disobeys God and his messenger, then surely for him is the fire of hell. He shall dwell therein forever. Judaism, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. So two destinations. Christianity, similarly, if you're either in the book of life or you're thrown into the lake of fire. So uh, very uh, similar. And of course, these three faiths are the Abrahamic faiths and they have several things in common they all go back to one person Abraham who lived in the Middle East and in southern Iraq as we know it now but belief in one God who's the creator and judge who's uh, this God who speaks through prophets through scriptures and that death is not the end but it leads to judgment where each one of us meets God and we're sent to one of two destinations and this this raises the question when we're thinking about hope in the future uh, which of these four views is true? Is death the end? Is it a spirit world? Is it reincarnation or is it judgment? Because uh, what, what the actual case is, is incredibly important. Now, of course, I'm giving this talk as a Christian and I can tell you that, that my conviction is, uh, is that death leads to judgment. And I believe that because that was the very, very clear teaching of uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, why do I accept the authority of Jesus Christ? Well, because of his remarkable life, his unparalleled teaching that we can examine because it was written down by our observers, the miracles he performed uh, of healing or power over nature, the claims he made principally that he was God, the creator, visiting the earth in the form of a man. And then finally, his death on a cross and his rising from the dead after three days. So our Christianity is based on the idea that we can know what comes after death because we have someone who's come back from the dead who has told us and uh, someone who is the most remarkable person that's ever lived. So the, the whole Christian message, if you like, could be summed up by, by this. Uh, Tim Tebow was, of course, famous um, American football player played for the Denver Broncos and New York Jets. You can see tattooed or, or writ, at least written on his cheeks, John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible, that God loved the, the world so much that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And this was the message that uh, Peter the Apostle gave at Pentecost when 3,000 people were converted in the church uh, began in the first century that God has made Jesus Lord and Messiah. People said, well, what should we do? Because uh, we crucified him. And the message was very clear, repent and be baptized. Uh, in other words, turn away from the way that you've living and give yourself to, to God. And as a mark of that, be baptized and you will be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which will help you to live the kind of life that uh, God wants you to live. <clears throat> and here we have just finally 
uh, two other short verses on it. So Jesus himself saying, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. And then Paul, the apostle, who wrote uh, 13 books in the New Testament, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, uh, God, effectively, and believe that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So are vaccines enough? Well, uh, to protect you from COVID and to rescue us as a country out of this mess, probably, uh, unless there are some unexpected new variants which we can't vaccinate against. But, but I think we can be fairly confident we're on the way out of this, humanly speaking. Are vaccines enough to protect you from dying from something else? Uh, no, uh, let's get this in perspective. All of us are going to, to die from something. And in fact, the vast majority of people, even at the peak of COVID, are more likely to be killed by something other than, than COVID. And then the final question, this is the real uh, question about eternal hope. Are vaccines enough to protect you from, from judgment uh, and hell? Well, well, certainly not. Only Jesus can do that. And that is the fundamental Christian message, but that he offers this forgiveness and eternal life absolutely free of charge to those who will turn from their previous lives and put their faith and their trusting their trust uh, in him going forward. So uh, there we are. Uh, back to you, um, Bev. I'll just uh, unminimize my screen again. Uh, I've gone a little bit over time, but um, back to you uh, in terms of taking us forward. Thank you, Peter. That was incredibly comprehensive. Thank you. Um, my children have confessed to watching some of their teachers pre-recorded um, lessons at double speed. Um, I reckon we probably all need to watch um, this recording on half speed because you've managed to cram in an awful lot of stuff um, along so many issues. So, so thank you very much. Um, as Peter says, we now have an opportunity to ask questions. So please do um, send some in on the chat function. Um, perhaps in the meantime, um, Kieran, you could put up the slide that just references some of the, um, the websites that Peter mentioned um, before. Um, so if you want to find out more um, about ICMDA, <clears throat> about their webinars and, and resources, you could um, go to these web pages when they come up. Sorry, Kieran, to put you on the spot. Fantastic, keep going. Yes, there's literature. Great, here's a, a book that, um, if you could just go back, um, this is a book that, that Peter himself has written, The hum Human Journey, that also comes, um, you can buy it as a course, I believe about 10 sessions or something to go through. Um, <clears throat> so have a look at that. And then some websites for you to look at, including Peter's blog and his email address. So. Any questions that don't get um, answered tonight, email Peter. Thank you. So let's have a, a look at um, some of the questions that have come up. Okay. Um, so first question, um, Peter, wh what country will help send vaccines to our poorer countries? Someone asks. Great question. The, the WHO um, has set up uh, a, a, a project called COVAX, and COVAX is, has the responsibility of gathering up the excess vaccines from uh, particularly the first world countries and making them available in Africa and Asia. And if you've been following the news, you'll know that uh, that our Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been quite outspoken on this at the G7 and uh, you know, encouraging Britain to lead the way. We're going to have a lot of spare vaccine here. But uh, the question is, is it going to be enough and is it going to get there quickly enough? Well, time will tell, but I, I think what we can be thankful for is that in South Asia, in India, it seems that the virus is not producing the same mortality as in the West. We're not exactly sure why that is. 
because it's gone through about 50% of the population, but we it appears that people have a higher degree of resistance and that the elderly people are better protected. You see, they're not in care homes, they're in rural areas and families and, and much better protected. And India are, are very well organized in terms of the health system, so they have their own vaccine now. Uh, Africa, again, has been a lot slower. I, I suspect, again, that's a similar thing about resistance to um, viruses, only time and research will tell that, and also slower travel because the countries are not as frequently visited and don't have big airport hubs. But there's a huge challenge facing us, and I think there's a huge responsibility on the, on the rich West to make those vaccines much more readily accessible in lower and middle income countries. Uh, the problem is, one of the problems logistically is that two of the vaccines that are most effective we have, so that's uh, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, have to be kept at very, very low temperatures and they require very sophisticated technology and transport systems. So they're not going to work in the developing world. But when, uh, when it comes to the developing world, I think the real game changers are going to be our own one, the Oxford Astra AstraZeneca, which is the one I had today, uh, and secondly, Janssen from Johnson & Johnson, which is now being used in the US and should be approved here very soon too. Uh, it's a one-shot vaccine and like uh, AstraZeneca, it doesn't need to be kept at you know, minus 20 or minus 70 degrees and a fridge is, is fine for it. So big challenges, but there's a way ahead, but I think it's calling for a huge outpouring of Western generosity. That's the challenge for us. Thank you, Peter. Um, uh, a, a big question I'm going to ask you now, and since you're so good at saying things so quickly, you might be able to manage this, but um, you mentioned a quote um, that said, those who have a why to live can bear with any how. Um, so the question, if God does exist, why would he inflict coronavirus on us? Well, that's a huge question that we could spend a whole session on. I, I think I think briefly, uh, first of all, we live in a fallen world where we believe that as a consequence of human beings' rejection of God, the world is damaged and broken. And this is why we have war, disease, and these things. Secondly, there's, there's the impact of human free will. And, and I think there's no doubt this would have been much uh, easier to negotiate had we handled it better at the beginning. So there've been, there's been human error in the, in the handling of it. Uh, thirdly, I think as Christians, we always look at life in the context of the future and in the context of, of heaven and, and hell, uh, particularly, that, um, that God can use difficulty and suffering in order to help us uh, get organized to be better and caring for others, but also uh, we've got to see it in the context of the future that there is going to be an end and uh, and uh, a judgment. And if we lived in a world where nothing went wrong at all, then we we would all be going to that uh, totally unprepared. So th those are a few answers. But but I think uh, most of all, when we look at God's attitude for suffering, we look at the life of Jesus Christ, who himself was God living on the earth in human form, we believe. And Jesus's attitude and approach to suffering was that he annihilated suffering in others through the healing and acts of compassion that he carried out. And then he took suffering on himself by going to the cross in order to make, uh, in order that we could be reconciled with God. So I think that's what really tells us about God's heart uh, in suffering. But, um, when the Bible talks about this, it, it talks first of all about uh, the wonders of, of heaven that eye has not seen nor ear heard nor mind conceived what God's prepared for those who, who've turned to him. But on the other hand, God's mercy, we see in delaying and delaying and delaying judgment to give people a chance to come uh, back to him. So I think that's the question suffering asks of us is, is have we heard the message, as C.S. Lewis said, uh, suffering is like God's megaphone to awaken uh, a, a deaf world. Are we listening uh, to, to it and are we taking on board the, the coming 
judgment and acting appropriately uh, and responding to God's rescue plan through Christ. So th th there's some, some thoughts, but we could spend a whole hour or more talking about suffering. Thank you very much. Um, one final question. Do you think we're going to have to have vaccines every year um, against COVID from now on? No, great question. It, it's not it's not like um, it's not going to be like tetanus where you or, or yellow fever where you take it and it lasts you 10 to 15 years. But in the same way, it's not going to be like the common cold, which you can't vaccinate against because the virus is changing so rapidly. It's, it's going to be somewhere in the middle, probably like the flu, uh, where you are having a shot every uh, year or so or every six months. Now, because it's early days, we don't really know what's going to happen and we'll have to see what research shows us. But uh, we do know that the vaccine will last in most people at least six months. So that's great news. But we also know that it's a vaccine that, that mutates and there are new variants and that, uh, that some of those new variants, uh, the vaccines aren't as effective against. So I think we're looking at a future where we will have, uh, uh, where we'll be living with this disease long into the future, like the, the flu, but like the flu or HIV, it's not going to be anything like the killer it has been, but that we will have to be protected by regular vaccination. So they say it's it's dangerous to prophesy, particularly with regard to the future, but that would be my best guess on the on the basis of the science we've seen so far. Okay, thank you very much. Look, I don't, I don't have any more questions and, and our time is up. I guess that must mean um, that you were incredibly comprehensive <laughs> first time round. So um, thank you so much for that, Peter. I um, really appreciate all the work that has, has gone into that presentation for us and giving us such a wonderful sweep um, of the situation and some of the implications and looking at world health and world economy, all of these things, as well as worldviews and trying to make sense of, of all of this. So um, a huge thank you to you for that. And I would urge people to get in touch. Thank you, a few people clapping there, but some virtual claps going on. That's wonderful. Um, let, let me just say to, to everyone um, present, um, do drop Peter a line, or if you're curious to, to know more about the things that, that Peter has spoken about, um, about how God brings a, a real and, and lasting hope, gives us hope in the face of, of, of death, in the inevitability of death, um, do get in touch with us um, at Surrey Chapel. So our website is www.surreychapel.org.uk. Um, and we would love uh, to hear from you. We would um, love to talk to you one to one. Uh, we can send you a Bible. Um, you can join an online course um, where you can meet with other people to investigate Christianity, investigate some of those things that, that Peter raised. You can look at an eyewitness account of Jesus's life and his teachings. You can look at his death. You can look at his resurrection. You can look at his miracles and um, see what you make of it. Um, I'd encourage you to, to sign up for one of those courses. Um, and you can also come along on a Sunday, both physically or in the comfort of your own home on the Surrey Chapel um, YouTube channel. Um, we have a live stream service at 9.30 every Sunday morning. There's also um, two services um, particularly aimed at families at 11 and 3.30. Um, so do, do look us up. OK, well, um, thank you again very much um, to Peter. We really appreciate all your input tonight. Thank you to everyone um, coming along. We do hope you found this evening um, helpful. And do get in touch if we can be in any further help. So a very good night to you all. Good night.